Welcome, everybody. This is the Southern California Water Dialogue. As I said, we're just uh, waiting for a few people to join us, but we're going to actually get it started. Um, my name is Connor Everts. I co-chair um, with DZINC. Um, I'm from the Southern California Watershed Alliance and also the uh, facilitator for the Statewide Environmental Water Caucus. Uh, DZINC uh, Assistant General Manager, External Affairs for the Metropolitan Water District. Um, I'll be doing the introduction and she'll be doing the questions and answers. So hold your questions and answers. I'd like to thank our steering committee. Um, without the steering committee, we wouldn't have our uh, monthly uh, subjects, our speakers, or the promotion of all of this. So I wanna thank everybody who's listed there. Um, I don't think on with us yet, but all with our coordinator, uh, Kathy Caldwell, who really pulls this all together. I wanna to thank her as well. And I wanna thank all of you who have joined us today. Our quick ground rules are, if you have technical difficulties, use the chat feature to let us know. If you're asking a question, put it in the Q&A and uh, click to send. It's, um, we'll go through this a little bit more afterwards, but if you have a poor connection, move closer to your wireless router or turn off anything else using bandwidth. And ultimately, if you have to turn off your video. Um, you are all muted by default. Um, the presentation runs about 60 minutes, followed by our dialogue or our question and answer portion of it. Um, you won't be disabled to see all of the participants on the list. Um, so to ask a question quickly, just use the Q&A. Um, and then if you would, um, the speakers are not gonna answer in the Q&A, they're actually gonna answer in person as we move forward. You can also upvote an item if you wanna hear it uh, sooner than later. Um, so you can use that feature as well. Very quickly, these are the, I'll do a, a introduction um, each speaker will then announce the next speaker. We'll have our discussion, as we said, it goes about an hour. And then, as I mentioned as well, the actual dialogue or questions and answers will be led by DSYNC. And we'll have some concluding remarks at the end. Here we go. Our speakers <laughs> are shown there below. Um, thank you, Greg and Elisa and Connor. It's nice for me to have someone else named Connor on this, but to be clear, um, the important one today is the speaker. Um, so thank you all. Uh, we're talking about where I'm gonna to to speak for a moment before we go to the first slides. So this issue came out of a discussion and a meme a lot of you may have heard recently that the, um, and I wanna make clear this um, meeting is being recorded. Uh, it will be posted just so you all know you're being recorded. Uh, it will be posted not immediately, but eventually on our um, website for Southern California Water Dialogue. Um, so the issue is, you know, as we've gone the whiplash climate from uh, extreme dryness to extreme wetness, um, <laughs> I'm sure some of uh, us have experienced these cells dropping right on top of us or, you know, we've gone up, we were at the 14th wettest uh, winter or rain year in Los Angeles, and I'm sure that's gone up recently. Um, we're about 25 inches above our normal. There is never a normal, but when, you know, the average of around uh, just under 15. Um, so a lot of people are saying, why can't we capture all of the storm water? Why are we wasting water to the ocean? And I think there are two things that we really want to bring out. One, that we are doing a lot. There's a lot of programs in Southern California that have done and are continuing to do and expanding what they do in terms of storm water. Uh, we've talked in the past about Measure W for Los Angeles and what that means for long-term programs as well. Um, and then there's also the environmental perspective that all water isn't wasted that goes to the ocean. Some is always going to go to the ocean anyway. We can't capture or store everything that happens. We're working hard putting back in the ground, but we also need to acknowledge that there is value in the wetlands that we have left, um, that that actually their function is to clean up some of the water that comes out as we capture the pollution initially. Um, it also means something to the fish that come back upstream, like salmon and steelhead. It says a signal. Um, the, uh, salmon can actually smell their natal stream to where to go back. Uh, so now it's an issue for Northern California, Central California, 
but uh, once we had salmon down to Newport Bay and we still have Southern steelhead. All right, I just wanted to bring those issues up um, as we deal with uh, these issues on a very live and timely basis. Um, well, first, we're gonna start with uh, Greg Woodside, uh, optimizing stormwater in Northern and Central Orange County. Take it away, Greg, thank you very much. Thank you, Connor, and thank you for the invitation to be here. The next slide, please. Uh, I wanna talk about California's unique annual variations in rainfall. Next slide. This is a map that shows the coefficient of variation of total precipitation based on a period of data from 1951 to 2008 and the reference for the papers at the bottom there. So what this is, is the standard deviation of annual precipitation divided by the average. So the bigger the number, the greater the annual variability in precipitation. And so you see looking across the map, California and particularly Southern California has the largest variation. Next slide, please. So Southern California has the most year-to-year -year precipitation variability in the nation. I think we all kind of know California is different. Just another reason California is different than the rest of the country. Next slide. So to put that in perspective, I did this about two years ago. So this is data through 2021. I had a site I found with LA rainfall data, 143 years of data, the maximum annual in a year, 38 inches, the minimum four inches. No one, nowhere else in the country has that kind of variability year to year. So for example, Atlanta, Georgia, I found a site with data from 1996 to 2001. The maximum was 70, the minimum was 30. And that's typical of what you see across much of our country is much, much less variability than we have here in Southern California. So practically what that means is if you build stormwater capture facilities, you need to be prepared that in some years, they're gonna sit mostly idle. That's just the way our hydrology works. Next slide, please. So Orange County Water District, uh, we're in North Central Orange County. We were created by the state of California in 1933 to manage the Orange County groundwater basin. So our boundary extends from the LA County line down through Central Orange County um, through portions of the city of Irvine. Next slide, please. We are at the lower end of the Santa Ana River watershed. So this is our watershed boundary, begins on the upper right up near Big Bear. Santa Ana River flows through San Bernardino, Riverside, down to Prado Dam, which is shown in the roughly the middle part of this figure. Uh, Prado Dam is very important for what we do for stormwater capture. We'll be talking about that. And then again, um, OCWD is in the lower part of this figure, uh, the lower left. So we're at the bottom end of the Santa Ana River watershed. We benefit in that sense in that we have a large tributary area upstream of us that provides stormwater runoff. Next slide, please. This is, this is a cross section through our groundwater basin. It's drawn along the Santa Ana River from roughly Anaheim through Santa Ana and Huntington Beach. And there's a lot of things shown here, but what I wanna focus on is the blue shaded areas. These depict the aquifers in our groundwater basins. In our groundwater basin, there's multiple aquifers. These are layers of sand and gravel that store water and are also very permeable. So pumping wells in our basin pump water from these aquifers and the groundwater basin provides about 85% of our local water supply. So our district has 2.5 million residences, re residents and the groundwater basin provides 85% of their water supply. Next slide, please. This is a little more detailed view of our area. Um, we have our groundwater replenishment system, our recyc recycled water project that's down near the coast that produces recycled water that we recharge into our aquifer. But stormwater capture from the Senan River is also a significant part of our water supply. And this shows the location of Prado Dam just upstream of us uh, near the city of Corona. But along the river, uh, we recharge water in the riverbed itself. And then in basins adjacent to the river, which are symbolized here. Next slide, please. 
So this is aerial, aerial view uh, of some of our basins. Um, these three here, Anaheim Lake, Miller Basin, Kramer Basin. OCWD owns the land where Anaheim Lake and Kramer Basin is. Miller Basin is owned by the County of Orange Flood Control District. And the county lets us use Miller Basin both for groundwater recharge, but it's also a, a flood risk management facility. So this figure indicates that in these basins here, we can recharge Santa Ana River water, imported water that comes through the metropolitan system, and also recycled water from our groundwater replenishment system. So um, this particular part of our system has a lot of flexibility to recharge different types of water. This year, we've been recharging significant amounts of Santa Ana River water due to the rainfall and associated stormwater runoff that's occurred. Next slide, please. So this zooms in a little bit more. Um, we're here um, near roughly the intersection of the 55 and 91 freeway is where a large amount of our recharge facilities are in the cities of Anaheim and Orange. So at Prado Dam, a very important upstream storage facility. Um, that's about 11 miles from Prado Dam down to our first location where we recharge water. And again, we recharge water in the river channel itself and in the blue basins that are off the river. And we have some pumping uh, facilities between our basins also. So we have about, uh, we have in round numbers, 1,000 acre feet, I'm sorry, 1,000 acres of spreading facilities. So those spreading facilities allow us to recharge a significant amount of water. Next slide, please. So Prado Dam, uh, again, located near the city of Corona. Um, OCWD and the Army Corps of Engineers have a longstanding partnership that's been very successful to temporarily hold stormwater at Prado Dam. Uh, the dam was built in 1941, currently undergoing some, some modifications, such as raising the spillway. The spillway is what's shown on the right there. And really starting about the mid-1980s, OCWD and the Corps really started working together to really increase stormwater capture. There'd always been a little bit of stormwater capture from the dam's construction when it was first built in 1941, but really in the 1980s, um, the two agencies really started working together to expand that. Next slide, please. This shows our current program. Uh, a couple of important points. Um, the primary purpose of Prado Dam is flood risk management. So that's the driver for how the dam's operated. But there's a secondary benefit or secondary purpose of water conservation. That's a term of art, if you will, that you could also just refer to it as stormwater capture. OCWD does not have any storage rights. So as the owner and operator of the dam, the Army Corps has complete discretion to operate the dam for flood risk management. But if they can hold water for us up to a certain elevation, that's the elevation shown there at 505 feet, 505 feet above sea level, um, they will hold that water and release it at a rate that we can capture it downstream. And that amount of water at elevation 505 is in round numbers 20,000 acre feet. So this year we've gotten up to that level and actually the water service elevation has actually exceeded 505, but the core will release water in the buffer pool uh, up in that space between a dry reservoir and elevation 505, that's referred to as the buffer pool, will release that water at a rate that we can capture it downstream. So in the fall, we can divert off the river in the range of 500 to 700 cubic feet per second in the fall. And this kind of year where we get a lot of runoff, uh, as the river water comes down, it contains fine grain sediment, which accumulates in our recharge basins and our recharge basins percolation rate slowly declines so that later in the year we're reduced in terms of how much we can recharge uh, compared to the early season where we can do 500 to 700 CFS in the fall. So a couple notes here too. Um, we have a references for the current spillway, uh, which is at 543 and the future spillway. Again, that's the ongoing work the Corps is doing to uh, make some modifications to Prado Dam. So think of it this way, you know, if we didn't have that buffer pool that the core released water for us at a rate we can capture it, if they were releasing it just to empty the reservoir, 
the water would come to us so fast we could not capture very much of it. But by releasing it slowly, at a rate we can capture it downstream, then we can recharge that water in the buffer pool into our basin. So this year, our core, uh, our staff and core staff are talking multiple times per week um, so that we can ask the core to release water at a rate we can capture it um, rather than what they would just do if they were just operating the reservoir for flood risk management. Next slide, please. So this shows um, how, how it's gone this year. So across the bottom, we have the dates um, starting from July last, last summer. Uh, the y-axis is the storage volume, the actual water in storage at the dam. So you can see uh, the storage, the, the reservoir is basically empty. Uh, zero means an empty dry, dry dam throughout the summer, late summer, early fall. You can see there in November, you see the first uptick. That was our first real significant rainfall event in November. So the storage went up to about 7,000 acre feet. That decline you see there in mid-November is the core releasing the water from storage at a rate we can capture it. So we would capture all that water. Reservoir goes dry again in December. There's another small rain event, probably around December 10th. That gives us about 3,000 acre feet. That water then is released. We capture all of that. And that takes us to about Christmas time. And then that last week of December, right around 1st of January, it really starts to rain. You see the reservoir fills up to 20,000 acre feet of water in storage and then goes all the way up to 30,000 acre feet of water in storage. So between um, 20,000 acre feet of storage and 30,000 acre feet of storage, the core is gonna drain that very rapidly. So you see that steep decline in storage. They're releasing at a rate that we can't capture all of it. We do capture some still when they're doing these higher releases, but they're releasing it at multiple thousands of CFS. Um, a chunk of that water, a big chunk of that water is flowing past us to the ocean, but we're still capturing a little bit. And then you see as the as the storage volume gets down to about 19,000 acre feet, you see the rate of decline of storage changes. It's not as steep. We're capturing then all that water there in mid-January. Uh, looks like there's a typo in my uh, bottom of my graph there. I didn't notice till right now. That second one, the second January should be February. So in in late in middle in, in late January. February until mid-February, we're capturing all that water that's released. And then it goes back up again with a rainfall event in late fe February, goes above 20,000 acre feet of storage. And again, the core drains it quickly. Um, so this is the plot as of Monday with the rain that we had just the last uh, day or so. There'd be a, another uptick of this graph that's not shown. So through Monday, we had captured the combination of recharge water in the ground and water in storage that we can recharge, we've, we have 51,000 acre feet of water this year. So it's been a great year. Next slide, please. So can we do better? And the answer to that is yes. Next slide, please. Our focus now is using forecast-informed reservoir operations, also called FIRO. So this uses enhancements in weather and, run and runoff forecasting to improve re reservoir operations. And this activity includes a growing understanding of atmospheric river events. These are the events that bring us most of our large rainfall events. Not every single rainfall event that's large has an AR associated with it, with it but most of them do. And the effort at Prado is really building upon groundbreaking work that was completed for Lake Mendocino in Northern California on the Russian River that was led by Sonoma Water, the Army Corps of Engineers, and Dr. Marty Ralph at Scripps at the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. So we are one of four pilot studies that's funded by the U.S. Congress to look at using Bureau forecast informed reservoir operations to increase stormwater capture. Next slide, please. So how that would work with Prado, it would essentially um, give us an additional amount of storage that could be used to capture stormwater at Prado Dam. So we believe, and we're going through a 
a detailed study of this at this time. We believe with Firo, we likely will be able to hold additional water, potentially up to 15,000 additional acre feet of storage space by incorporating Firo principles. Next slide, please. So we have requested, and the Corps is processing a deviation to test Firo at Prado Dam. Think of a deviation as a temporary change to the water control manual for the dam. And this request for the deviation was based on the results of a preliminary viability assessment of here at Prado Dam, which is available on the OCWD website and is also available on this, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes website as part of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So this deviation would be a five-year period to test here at Prado Dam. It would provide an additional 6,000 acre feet of storage space. And we are working with the core to have that in place by October of this year. Next slide, please. So in summary, there's four things that I would highlight that are important that has helped us be successful in capturing stormwater. First of all is geography. And in particular, we are at the lower end of the Santa Ana River watershed. So there's a large upstream tributary area that we benefit from providing us runoff. Secondly is the geology. We have a series of aquifers that provide storage space. And the aquifers, in fact, come up to the ground surface in Anaheim. So we have an area of Anaheim and Orange where at the surface, the aquifer comes to the ground surface. So at the surface, we can build very effective recharge facilities in sediments that have very high permeability and percolate water rapidly. So the third part of it is the facilities. So these are facilities, again, mostly in Anaheim and Orange. Um, I've show, showed here the recharge basins. The other very important facility is the upstream storage at Prado Dam. Without that storage, we would be much, much less effective at recharging stormwater. And then lastly, I'd point to collaboration. It takes a lot of um, different parties working together to make this successful. I, named, I list some of them here, the Army Corps of Engineers with Prado Dam, and also core regulatory for the 404 permits we acquire to maintain our facilities. The County of Orange Public Works, they're the local sponsor, one of the local sponsors for Prado Dam, and they also let us jointly use their recharge facilities or their, their flood management facilities in Orange County for groundwater recharge. The State Water Resources Control Board, um, they issue us a permit. We have a water rights permit for Santa Ana River water from the State Board. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, again, for permits and biological opinions for the water conservation program and the maintenance of our facilities. OCWD's 19 pumpers, they're the ones who primarily fund our work uh, to do this by an assessment on pumping, and then many others. I won't, I won't go into the others, but um, again, extensive collaboration needed for us to be successful. That concludes my presentation. I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Connor Mosavi is a civil engineering associate, associate in LADWP's watershed management group, where he's been developing stormwater capture projects and programs for over three years. Connor holds a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering from UCLA. With that, I'll turn it over to Connor. Thank you, Greg, and hello, everyone. I'm very excited to talk to you today about the work that we do at the LADWP Watershed Management Group, why we do it, and whether we can do better. Next slide. Our job is to develop and manage stormwater capture projects with the goal of enhancing our local water supplies and reducing our reliance on imported water. We plan on achieving this goal through water recycling and conservation efforts as well, which have already had great success. But today I'm going to specifically talk about our stormwater challenges and solutions in Los Angeles, our watershed management goals, some specific stormwater projects and programs that we're implementing, regional coordination efforts, and how that can translate to acquiring project funds, and the importance of creating multi-benefit projects and forging partnerships with other organizations in order to get the job done. Next slide. 
Stormwater has historically presented many cha challenges to Los Angeles. In the past, we viewed stormwater as a liability due to the threat that floods have posed to residents and civilian infrastructure. Over several years, urbanization further exacerbated flooding since the city's surfaces became less permeable, which reduced infiltration of stormwater into our groundwater basins. Also, oftentimes, especially during first flush storms, stormwater carries harmful pollutants, which we don't want contaminating our beaches or other water bodies. So the response to these issues was to channelize LA, effectively sending precious stormwater into the ocean. Next slide. Here are two photos of the San Fernando Valley in the city of Los Angeles, nearly 100 years apart. You can see how much has changed, particularly how today land is more impervious, which gets in the way of recharging the underlying aquifer and increases localized flooding. Next slide. Now, since we can't undo all of that urbanization, one way to recharge groundwater and increase our local water supplies is the use of stormwater best management practices or BMPs. So stormwater BMPs can include any infrastructure used to capture and treat stormwater. The pathway shown on this slide consists of seven steps, which is first to collect the stormwater, then to remove macro particles with pretreatment BMPs. Then we want to use some kind of infiltration BMP like uh, spreading basins to recharge the unconfined aquifer. The stormwater is then stored in the groundwater and undergoes soil aquifer treatment. And finally, we want to pump the water out, treat it again, and then send it out for drinking water. This is one key approach outlined in LAWP's Stormwater Capture Master Plan, which is our guiding document on stormwater capture. Next slide. The Stormwater Capture Master Plan outlines our stormwater strategy over 20 years. It quantifies stormwater capture potential, identifies opportunities to maximize stormwater capture, develops various cost metrics and timelines for projects and programs, and finally, it identifies potential partnerships. Next slide. So what is our main watershed management goal at LADWP? Well, our goal is to capture 150,000 acre feet per year of stormwater by the year 2035. Now, I want you all to think to yourselves, how many households do you think 150,000 acre feet would serve each year? And if you take a second to think about it, and if you guessed 600,000 households, roughly, that is correct. So our goal is to capture enough stormwater to serve about 600,000 LA households by the year 2035. And you can see our project on this chart. Our actual achievements are shown in blue and our projections are shown in green. With the completion of several stormwater projects over the next decade, we believe we are on track to meet our goal by 2035. Next slide. But the question remains, can we do better? And the answer is yes, we can. And we're always looking for ways to capture more stormwater and to do it faster. First and foremost, we plan on maximizing stormwater capture by focusing our efforts on recharging the San Fernando groundwater basin. This is an unconfined aquifer that underlies permeable soils. And the area overlying the aquifer doesn't have a lot of flood management infrastructure in place, so it's frequently flooded with stormwater. We also have water rights to this basin, so we can pump and actually use that water. Therefore, this is the ideal area to focus on maximizing stormwater capture. But for other parts of the city where infiltration is not as favorable, We'll develop reuse systems wherein we capture the stormwater for direct on-site use, such as irrigating our fields, grass, vegetation. But stormwater can also be diverted to the sanitary sewer and sent to water reclamation facilities for treatment. And this is an emerging trend in the LA region, especially for areas that overlie lower priority aquifers. 
We also need to think about how to fund our projects. So securing grant funding is crucial and forming partnerships with other organizations is often necessary to achieve multi-benefits that can help projects qualify for additional funding. Partnerships naturally result in more well-rounded projects and they're more multi-beneficial projects that benefit all stakeholders, including the community and the public at large. Next slide. One example of a centralized and highly cost-effective project that recharges the San Fernando groundwater basin is the Tahanga Spreading Grounds. In partnership with the LA County Flood Control District, the improvements at these spreading grounds were completed in November, 2021, and consisted of deepening and consolidating 20 spreading basins into nine larger basins in, in order to free up capacity. There were also improvements to the intake structures as well as open green space added for passive recreational use. The project doubled the capacity of the spreading grounds to 16,000 acre feet per year, which is enough to supply water to about 64,000 households each year. Next slide. More examples of centralized projects include our nine stormwater park projects. These projects are part of our stormwater capture parks program, which will construct large subterranean storage basins for infiltration of stormwater underneath LA's parks. These projects will recharge the underlying aquifers with nearly 3,000 acre feet per year of stormwater and will have a capital cost of about half a billion dollars. But we're not just capturing stormwater with these projects. The program will also revitalize several acres of park space by upgrading the parks with new basketball courts, baseball and soccer fields, sports lighting systems, trees, irrigation, walkways, hydration stations, and much more. So these projects will incorporate multiple community benefits. Next slide. Here's a high level conceptual cross section of a typical LADWP stormwater park project. As you can see, stormwater flows in from an existing storm drain or channel and reaches the infiltration gallery where it undergoes um, groundwater recharge. And you can see that we're preserving and enhancing use of open space and recreational features at the park. Next slide. As opposed to these larger centralized projects that we've been discussing, distributed projects are smaller and typically capture less than 100 acre feet per year. So they consist of multiple smaller BMPs that are often more spread out. And one common type of distributed project that we're developing throughout LA are green streets. These are projects that are usually constructed within the public right of way, like along sidewalks or street medians, and they typically include transportation improvements as well. The BMPs need to be compact to fit within the limited available space on LA streets. So we typically use bioswales for pretreatment, like the one pictured on this slide, and dry wells for infiltration. Other green street elements typically include new trees, sidewalks, lighting, bike lanes, and enhanced pedestrian safety. One example of a Green Streets program that we've recently implemented in partnership with our sister agency, LA Sanitation, is the San Fernando Valley Distributed Projects. This program consists of five Green Street projects that collectively capture over 400 acre feet per year of stormwater. Now, aside from successfully implementing projects like these on an individual basis, we have asked ourselves, can we do better? And the way we're striving to do better is by shifting our approach to a more integrated regional approach through new efforts such as the Infrastructure LA Initiative. Next slide. The Infrastructure LA Initiative formed in 2022 after President Biden signed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill into law. Through this initiative, agencies in LA County are leading collaborative efforts to maximize the region's share of federal infrastructure funding as it becomes available through the bipartisan infrastructure law. The initiative will particularly focus on projects that advance equity, sustainability, and climate resilience. 
The project map shown on this slide is publicly available and it's an online database of nearly 700 projects at various stages of development in LA County. This map shows whether projects are located in disadvantaged communities as well using the federal climate and economic justice screening tool. The database is continually expanding with new project submittals, and it will be instrumental in forging partnerships in the region that will maximize efficiency in delivering stormwater capture projects. Next slide. Measure W is another regional scale program that I believe Connor Everts alluded to earlier in this session. And it has been instrumental in bringing project developers, agencies, and various community stakeholders together to fund and deliver projects at an accelerated pace. Measure W is also known as the Safe Clean Water Program, as you can see on this slide. And it passed in 2018 with 70% of the vote. The program is funded by a special parcel tax of two and a half cents per square foot of impermeable area in LA County. And examples of taxable and permeable areas include driveways, pathways, and rooftops. So if you know anyone who pays property taxes in LA, this will show up as a line item on the bill. The tax costs the median household about $83 per year. And in total, it generates nearly $300 million per year with no sunset provision. So this means that this could be an indefinite funding source. Next slide. The Safe Clean Water Program can fund a diverse portfolio of projects, concepts, and studies that align with its objectives. Some key objectives include increasing local water supplies with sustainable sources, improving water quality, mitigating flooding, and providing other community benefits like recreational opportunities in disadvantaged communities. So as a means of accomplishing these objectives, the program prioritizes the creation of local green jobs and nature-based solutions, which consist of natural processes such as infiltration, soil aquifer treatment, and planting trees and other native vegetation to sequester atmospheric carbon. As a funding program, the Safe Clean Water Program is unique in that funds can be used for operations and maintenance of projects, and project developers, including NGOs, may be eligible to receive funds during earlier st stages of project development like planning and design, which could provide the much needed resources to drive these projects forward. LEWP has successfully secured over $70 million in safe clean water funding for its stormwater capture parks program. And these park projects are ideal candidates for safe clean water funding because of their strong mul multiple benefits and water supply benefits. Consistent with these safe clean water goals, the parks program will serve disadvantaged communities in high need of park improvements by revitalizing park space and creating local green jobs. While these projects have already garnered the support of several community groups, LAWP will continue to engage these communities to ensure that the projects meet their needs. Next slide. As you can imagine, multi-benefits are really important to funding programs like the Safe Link Water Program. Now, while increasing our water supply reliability and water quality may be primary objectives of a stormwater capture project, there could also be opportunities to enhance the habitat at a project location or reduce greenhouse gases by planting vegetation and adding various amenities like sports fields. Building multi-benefit projects is also crucial to forming partnerships with other organizations since they may have other priorities that they would like to see reflected in the project. Next slide. But achieving multi-benefits is not the only reason why forging partnerships is crucial to the successful implementation of these projects. Project developers often encounter challenges when developing stormwater projects including finding the land to build the projects or the expertise to design them and addressing the needs of the community. So here are some projects that would not have been possible without partnerships. We've partnered with the LA County Flood Control District on multiple spreading ground improvement projects, 
which will cumulatively bring over 26,000 acre feet of stormwater to LA on an annual basis. We're also partnering with transportation agencies like LA Metro on multi-benefit Green Street projects that will also provide significant transportation improvements to our city. And the city of San Fernando's Regional Park Infiltration Project is yet another stormwater park project that is expected to provide strong water supply and community benefits. Lastly, we, we frequently partner with LA Sanitation on Green Street projects in areas where we can collectively address water quality and flood management issues. So in summary, we face multiple water supply challenges that are further exacerbated by climate change. Because of the urgency of these issues, the world of stormwater is seeing a major paradigm shift from single issue transactional projects to truly multi-beneficial projects that are only made possible through collaboration with stakeholders in the region. We've developed a strategy that embraces the multi-benefit approach to expand LA's water supplies and meet the needs of DWP's service area for generations to come. And with statewide social and political prioritization of these projects, we strive to augment local water supplies, improve water quality, and provide benefits to underinvested communities. This way presenting a clear path to a sustainable region with a clean and reliable water supply. And always asking ourselves if we can do better. Now I'd like to introduce you to Annalisa Mo. Annalisa is a water quality scientist at Eel the Bay and she's actively working to keep LA water clean and safe by advocating for comprehensive science-based water quality regulation. Annalisa. Thanks, Connor. Um, and thanks also to the other Connor and to, to Dee for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, my name is Annalisa, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am uh, one of the water quality scientists with um, Heal the Bay. Um, and if anybody does not know uh, Heal the Bay, we're an environmental nonprofit um, dedicated to making the coastal waters and watersheds of Los Angeles safe, healthy, and clean. Um, my work really focuses on surface water discharges. Um, and of course, a big piece of that, especially in the Los Angeles area, is stormwater. Um, so any folks on the call today who know me have probably heard me talk about stormwater um, and uh, polluted urban runoff um, as, a, as a water quality issue um, and also about um, you know the potential solutions to it with programs like the Safe Clean Water Program. Um, but the previous two speakers, I think, have, have covered those bases pretty well. Um, so I'm going to look at um, another side of stormwater and talk about all of the potential benefits of uh, stormwater. Next slide, please. So let's take a, a step back first and talk about what a beneficial use of water is. Um, the, the term beneficial use is uh, defined under water law, um, and this particular term usually applies to surface waters, so our rivers, our lakes, or the ocean. Um, and the general goal is to have, you know, fishable, swimmable, drinkable water. Um, but the EPA definition of beneficial use is a use of water resources that benefits people or nature. Um, nice and simple, um, if maybe a little bit vague, um, but the EPA does specifically allow states to further refine that definition if they want to. And of course, the uh, state of California chose that option. Um, so under California's uh, Port of Cologne Water Quality Control Act, beneficial uses are defined as the use of water necessary for the survival and well-being of humans, plants, and wildlife. And they serve to promote economic, social, and environmental goals. Um, now, some examples of uh, beneficial uses um, include uh, things like water supply, recreation, commercial fishing, habitat. Um, there's also some new definitions that have been recently approved um, by the State Water Board, which include tribal beneficial uses as well as subsistence fishing. 
Um, but there are also benefits to stormwater before it even enters these surface waters and, and become defined in that way. Um, so in natural spaces, you can get infiltration, percolation, which uh, supports the subsurface ecosystem, all the biota that live within um, a healthy soil system, um, and also any vegetation that's present. Um, and depending on the location, it can also feed uh, groundwater reservoirs. Um, and just one final note is I have also learned and um, continue to learn from Indigenous nations about the inherent rights of water itself outside of the benefits that it provides. Next slide. Uh, so very quickly here, um, this is a land use map of the uh, Los Angeles area. Um, all the different shades of red here indicate developed areas. Um, I, I know most of the folks on the call today are probably from the LA area, so this probably will not come uh, as any surprise to folks. Um, but here in LA, um, where we have paved so much of the land um, and also concretized our rivers as well, um, there's a lot more water that flows out to the oceans uh, than would have without development um, because we're not allowing that natural infiltration. Next slide. So we end up with urban runoff. Um, and now urban runoff is currently considered the number one source of pollution in our waterways. Um, and much of that stormwater is wasted because of the way that we manage it. Um, so our storm drain system was actually designed specifically to move water out of Los Angeles as quickly as possible, which does not give it the chance to be used um, before it enters the ocean. Um, but it could instead provide beneficial uses um, if we can capture clean and use it um, or store it for later use or if we can simply create more natural space to allow for infiltration. Um, but as we move into the rest of this presentation, um, not all water that flows to the ocean statewide is wasted, um, especially in areas that are less urbanized than Los Angeles is today. Um, that flow often provides critical beneficial use for ecosystem health. Um, and to go through a few pretty stark examples of, of where this is occurring, um, I'm actually going to take us out of Los Angeles for a couple of slides. So next slide, please. Right. Um, so I'm going to start with the Sacramento uh, San Joaquin Delta, which provides, uh, it does provide water supply, um, drinking water, agricultural water supply. Um, and in this scenario, we have a lot of snow melt, but also stormwater um, flowing to the ocean. But it also supports critical ecosystems and endangered species. And in fact, this area, the, the um, Bay Delta, serves as um, important habitat to over 750 animals and plant species, um, including more than 40 aquatic species. And a long time ago, about 15 years ago, um, there were many years of public hearings and numerous analyses completed um, so that in 2010, the state board released a recommendation that 75% of the unimpaired flow from Sacramento River, so unimpaired would mean everything flowing through basically, so 75% from the Sacramento River and its tributaries should be allowed to flow naturally through the Delta into San Francisco Bay to protect the public trust. Um, now, in response to external pressures that were unrelated to the scientific analysis, um, the state board uh, ended up reducing these numbers pretty significantly to as little as um, like 9% flow in some specific waterways. Um, and then in 2018, released a framework proposing that 55% uh, of unimpaired flow remain in stream. Um, now, the bottom line is that fish need water, um, and the amount of water flowing through the Delta into San Francisco Bay um, is the primary driver of the health of the Bay Delta ecosystem. Um, now, the best available science still indicates that 65 to 75% of uh, flow is best to support this ecosystem. Um, and of course, in drier years, as much as 100% of the flow may be necessary to protect the Bay Delta. Um, now, speaking more generally, some rivers also flow into estuarine habitats downstream, um, which may have a berm or um, like a sandbar separating the estuary from the ocean. 
And that stormwater flow is necessary to breach that berm and initiate fish migration upstream. Um, so even the water that does end up going all the way out to the ocean provides a beneficial use by allowing fish to enter the stream and then migrate upstream for um, uh, migration purposes. Next slide. All right, next example is uh, further north up at the Klamath River. Um, and uh, luckily there's a lot of momentum right now to remove dams that have um, uh, been in the way of fish migration. Um, but the ecosystem also faces other threats, um, particularly related to flow. Um, so especially during times of drought when there is less precipitation, um, there's not enough water to maintain the minimum water levels needed upstream to protect the sucker fish and also the minimum flows downstream needed to provide habitat and migration corridors for salmon, um, which again, may need to flow all the way out to the ocean to allow for that migration to start in the first place. Um, and also to continue to divert the amount of water that we currently divert for other purposes, including agriculture. Um, and to be clear, this is not entirely because of the lack of precipitation, um, but rather the lack of planning and insufficient management of the water that we divert. Um, there's a, a state board resolution that states uh, some streams that provide habitat and migration corridors for federally and state listed endangered species will not maintain the minimum flows for these species to survive unless water diverters curtail use. Um, and to be honest, there is so much that we can still do as a state to improve our conservation and efficiency to curtail those diversions. Um, in fact, the state board held a workshop this morning on a framework for making conservation a California way of life because there is more that we can and must do, um, both at home, but more importantly on the larger scale with agriculture industry and uh, commercial use. Next slide, please. All right, so bringing us back home here, I'm talking about the LA River. Um, the water boards are currently supporting the development of technical tools and approaches uh, to define the flows necessary to support specific species and habitats um, to be ecologically protective, um, and also the flows necessary to sustain um, other beneficial uses uh, of the LA River. Um, and this is all happening through the Los Angeles River Flows Project. Um, this project is assessing non-aquatic life uses, um, also assessing aquatic life uses. Um, and then finally, they're also quantifying Effects, uh, effects of different um, flow management. So this study, when we're looking at the LA River, it's more actually about minimum flows during dry weather. Um, so again, our, our water management has been built to get water out of LA as quickly as possible. Um, and that natural flow has been replaced by discharge, mostly from wastewater treatment facilities. So, um, you know, First and foremost, recycling is great practice, um, but we do have to determine what needs to stay in before we can decide how much we can pull out to increase recycled water use. Um, and although this particular case is more focused on that dry weather flow, um, the LA River Flows Project does aim to quantify effects of flow management, uh, including stormwater flow. Um, so these dry weather flow conditions are um, often the critical condition for rivers in Southern California, um, but the stormwater flow does have to be taken into account as well. And there may be cases where some uh, flow can be beneficial, but again, we're urbanized, our rivers are lined with concrete. Um, so a lot of that stormwater flow does go out to the ocean without providing a, a beneficial use first. Next slide. So what are some of the different benefits of, of stormwater capture? Um, we can start with the basics. If we have you know, some of the gray infrastructure projects that have been presented today, um, we can get water quality benefits, you know, cleaning up the, the polluted urban runoff um, that uh, we, we created by urbanizing Los Angeles. 
We also potentially can get some water supply, especially if we're coordinating between departments and, um, and keeping that communication open so that we can make the most of, um, of this water resource. Also, you know, if built correctly, can help to reduce flooding. Um, but uh, this whole list changes if you introduce nature. Um, and that can happen if you know water falls on natural space, it infiltrates to support that subsurface ecosystem, then some of it runs off and enters a waterway and provides benefits by supporting the aquatic habitat there. Um, or it could look like removing hardscape and replacing it with natural space with healthy soils, healthy native vegetation. Um, but either way, um, if we have that, that introduction of, of natural solutions, um, and if you can click once on this slide, we go. The list gets a lot longer. Um, and you'll notice at the end there's an etc because this list um, is pretty much unending when we when we bring nature into the into the mix. Um, you can get, you know, especially when there's vegetation involved, cooler temperatures, more habitat, better habitat. Um, if you're using a, a good mix of native vegetations, you can get a rebound of those native plants and then also a rebound of the species that that live in that habitat. Um, there's carbon sequestration, um, there's opportunities for open space and recreation, um, education opportunities with the community, uh, local jobs and, and training opportunities, and again, the list goes on and on. Um, and one example um, uh, that isn't listed here is when we look at un unimpeded flow through rivers, um, naturally flowing from summit to sea, you also get the movement of sediments. Um, and that, you know, you can move uh, cobble-sized, boulder-sized, pebble-sized um, down into a river to create the habitat that might be necessary to protect species, especially um, when they're spawning or while they're in the juvenile state. Um, but also the smaller stuff, the, the um, sand um, and silt to go all the way out to the beach and the ocean to replenish our beaches. And of course, as sea levels rise, our, our beaches are being stripped more and more often and more quickly. Um, so allowing that natural uh, flow of sediment um, from, again, from summit to sea um, is, uh, is helpful in that way as well. Um, and then uh, I didn't get into it on this side, but just want to make note that there are also additional benefits when a project is also community-based and, and ideally community-driven so that you're addressing the right problems, um, you have community buy-in, you have community ownership, um, all those good benefits. Next slide, please. So I want to kind of wrap us up with, um, in you know, in the case of all of this, what what is it that that we need? Um, and to be honest, um, I can't say right now exactly how much water has to flow through the LA River or the San Gabriel River um, or really any other river in Southern California. Um, I don't I don't have the expertise to to state a number, um, but what I can say is that in Los Angeles with heavy urbanization and channelized river, there is more stormwater currently being wasted to the ocean. So active stormwater capture work is particularly beneficial here. Um, but I can also say that we need a long-term solution for holistic watershed health from summit to sea all the way through. Um, so I wanna, you know, quick shout out to organizations that champion uh, some truly nature-based projects, which like, at their core are based on soils, vegetation, and ecosystem health. Um, there are a couple pictures on the slide that I have here um, with, uh, you know, the River Project, who's been a longtime champion of this work, um, our old friends at, at From Lot to Spot, um, but also groups like the Nature Conservancy and Amigos de los Rios, um, many more out there that are doing this, uh, this nature-based work. And uh, a holistic approach to stormwater management supports rest uh, restoration activities. Uh, it expands the use of nature-based approaches to treat pollution at the source and also offer the associated benefits for habitat, wildlife, and outdoor recreation. 
um, and identifies opportunities to restore water quality and to restore physical processes that support critical habitat and ecosystem function. Um, and I'll point out that this is not just my opinion, um, but it's actually work being done by the EPA, um, almost directly quoted uh, from a, a project website um, from the EPA. Um, but I'll just add that a holistic water uh, watershed approach also needs to consider all of the benefits of water um, and not just you know, the source of, of water supply. And it also needs to consider those inherent rights of water and nature beyond the many ways in which we use them. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I am here to answer any questions, but I know we're going to do it as a group in a Q&A. So I will now hand things back to Dee to get us into that part of our discussion. Thank you, Annalisa. And uh, this is obviously a very popular program. We have 28 questions, some of which are comments. So I may uh, just acknowledge the comments and we'll move forward because with a half an hour, actually with 28 minutes left in our presentation and uh, needing to close off and announce our next program, we're gonna have to uh, move a little quickly through our Q&A. So if we do not get to your question and answer, uh, then we will endeavor to follow up with our speakers and either post the answers or get back to you directly. So we're capturing that electronically. And I'm gonna go ahead and start at the beginning of the questions, which uh, naturally fall within the order of our presentations today. So Greg, if you'd get ready. Um, we do have a span of questions from very technical uh, to more general, and we're starting with Dr. Clyde T. Williams. He asks a couple of questions, Greg, about um, how do you rate, uh, excuse me, how do you relate uh, the groundwater and climate change increasing the coefficient variable plus or minus four, five, six standard deviation to what is happening? So this is a scientific question, and he's also asking after that, how would you relate stormwater capture with the Water Factory 21 program? For those of you who don't know, that's uh, their uh, recycled water project of direct potable reuse and indirect potable reuse using groundwater. So Greg, if you could turn your camera on and uh, help us answer these questions, then we would appreciate it. Yes, we'll do. Um, I'm trying to turn my camera back on, but it's not letting me quite yet, but I'll go ahead and start, start answering. Thank you. So in terms of the effect on climate change on the coefficient of variation that was mentioned early on, so looking at the variability in rainfall, we've not done our own independent analysis of how that could change with climate change. You know, and looking at the scientific literature, what we're seeing is more evidence that the variability is going to get greater, but I don't have specific numbers on that that we've done for our watershed. And then in terms of Water Factory 21, that's our, our previous recycled water project that was replaced by the groundwater replenishment system. So in brief, I would say we recharge water from our recycled water facility and stormwater essentially in the same kind of facilities. So in some cases, those waters are blended and recharged in a groundwater recharge facility. Um, and we have not had any challenges with that at all. We, we, we use both, we use both sources of water and they, they both percolate in the same basin in some cases. I think you're muted, Deepa. Helps if I turn my microphone back on. The next question that we have relates to um, Prado Dam and it, it's asking about um, using the spillway um, in terms of releasing the water because it is adjacent or pointed towards the freeway. Can you speak to that? Uh, just a little bit. Um, the water has never reached the top of the spillway or the water has never reached the spillway elevation. So since the dam was built in 1941, that water service elevation has never gotten that high and actually it hasn't gotten even very close. So there's never been a flow over the spillway. Um, I would defer to the core in terms of, you know, how that would function. Um, but look, I would just say, you know, that's a very extreme event. Um, and as a as kind of a, a resident of Orange County, you know, that, that'd be a scary time. Let's just leave it at that for now. <laughs> yeah. 
There were some recent improvements, though, elevating the dam, right? They, they are working to raise the spillway um, okay. at Prado Dam. Yes, that, that is the Army Corps and the local sponsors. Thank you. Uh, the next couple of questions come from Craig Codwallader, excuse me. And he's asking for recharge, is water pumped in in addition to percolated? And if there's pumping, what percentage of total recharge does pumping represent? Mm -hmm. He also is asking at roughly what quantities annually are pumped and percolate, percolated. So in average numbers, the pumping from the basin is about 300,000 acre feet per year. And the managed aquifer recharge that we do averages about 220 to 250,000 acre feet per year. So the there's a difference there because there's just what Mother Nature recharge, recharges without our managed aquifer recharge. But our managed aquifer recharge, the facilities we built and operate, that's the vast majority of the recharge. And we're typically recharging, you know, like in a year like this, you know, over 200,000 acre feet per year between sand and river water and recycled water. I, I think I missed the other question. Can you repeat that again? Yeah, there was what quantities annually are pumped and percolated. So I think. You answered that. Yeah, and round numbers, 300,000 acre feet per year is pumped and total recharge is very similar to that. And we, we on a long-term basis, match total pumping and total recharge so that we're sustainable. Okay. Uh, this next question for is for you as well, Greg, uh, from Dennis Erdman. He's asking, since the completion of the Seven Oaks Dam, has there ever been more snow in the watershed than the present conditions? A couple of things, yeah. So Seven Oaks Dam was completed circa 1999. So the biggest wet year since that time period would have been 2004, 2005. And we've not reached this year, the amount of precip we had in 2004, 2005, 2004, 2005 was a very large year. So uh, we need to go back and compare um, the current year to, to 2004 to 2005. And, and the, the runoff from snowmelt is something that I think overall our models of runoff um, do not have a lot of sophistication in terms of you know how much of that snowmelt um, becomes runoff um, that comes down the streams into the upper watershed versus is transpired um, or used by plants, used by plants or evaporated. Uh, my just generalization is we just don't have real good models in our watershed yet of that kind of phenomena of the snowmelt process and how much snowmelt generates runoff. Thank you. Uh, this next question is from uh, Dr. Williams again, and, and it's asking, is DWP going to help BSE do 100% indirect potable reuse, including Hyperion redirected to Silmar? Um, I want to. I did skip over a question asking about the need for ocean desal. So, if anybody wants to respond to the need for ocean desal, um, then feel free to jump in on that as well. I would say that OCWD is not currently active actively pursuing studies of ocean desal. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll go ahead and respond to both questions. Um, even though I'm working in stormwater, so I'm not as uh, familiar with some of the indirect portable reuse or recycling efforts, um, we do work closely with our uh, recycling team here at DWP, and I understand with our Operation Next program, uh, there are there's a lot of coordination going on between our sister agencies in the city of Los Angeles uh, as it relates to water recycling. So we will be working on some of those water recycling efforts and indirect portable reuse, uh, including on Hyperion uh, improvements, the Hyperion formation plant. So that's, um, I hope that clarifies that question. And regarding the other question on desalination, DWP has looked into desalination as it relates to feasibility and cost effectiveness, and we continue to revisit that approach. However, um, currently we're not pursuing efforts on that front. And it kind of goes into the following question regarding the cost of groundwater captured versus recycled water versus desal. And I can get ahead and answer that one as well and say that um, there have been cost analyses. And with uh, at this time, desal is not as cost effective as those other approaches from stormwater capture and water recycling. 
uh, and there are also environmental challenges with that as well. So currently we're not pursuing desalination either. Thank you, Connor. And Annalisa, I see you have your hand up. So I think you want to talk to that as well. Yeah, I also want to chime in on the, the desal um, uh, piece of it because um, just as Connor just mentioned, you know, it is um, an expensive process. Uh, it's very energy intensive. It has some um, environmental impacts that, um, you know, that they can be minimized um, by like, you know, in, improving the technologies. But the only way to completely eliminate those um, environment, negative environmental impacts would be to not do it at all. Um, and in addition to that, you know, we are full swing in a climate crisis um, and uh, an increase in water, uh, water demand and a decrease in water supply is only one of the challenges that are associated with that crisis. Um, but when we look at desalination, um, has, you know, some negative impacts and then it only really provides one benefit single benefit of water supply um, versus other approaches like um, recycled water or stormwater capture um, that uh, provide multiple benefits. Um, and then when we bring natural solutions into it, that, that list of benefits becomes infinite. So um, if and when it's absolutely necessary, um, you know, there is a human right to water. Um, but especially in the Los Angeles area, we just haven't maximized our um, our use of those other potential sources with conservation, with recycling, stormwater capture. Um, so uh, it's, uh, you know, good to hear that that um, we're focused more on those other more multi-benefit approaches first. Thank you, Annalisa. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of comments to questions that I think Annalisa and Connor, you may want to respond to. One of them has to deal with um, the, the, well, the comment is the downside to putting stormwater infiltration in parks is that you remove large trees and reduce the places where large trees can go. And then it talks about um, that there isn't in the imagery that was shown um, for infiltration in planted areas, uh, there isn't images of healthy living soils or, and there hasn't been any commentary. Can either of you talk about that? I'm happy to tackle that one since it, I think it is referring to stormwater capture park projects, projects at uh, parks in LA. So I did speak to that. And um, well, the beauty of our stormwater capture parks program is that these stormwater components are almost entirely located underground. I think the main part is that infiltration gallery, which some of them can be quite large and they're entirely subterranean. So we are preserving use of the park above the stormwater BMPs but also we're working really closely with our agency, um, partner agency, Recreation and Parks on uh, working around these, um, some of these environmental aspects of the projects, including trees and working around uh, rigorous tree protection zones and tree replacement ratios. So all of these projects actually will have a net increase in the number of trees at each of the parks, which will provide some of those um, it alleviates some of those concerns with some of the environmental uh, benefits that these projects are bringing. So fortunately, we haven't had a problem with um, a major issue with uh, major trees and inhibiting a recreational uses of the parks. And could you also comment, there's a com there's another comment in the, in the questions about tree cuts, uh, curb cuts, in the sidewalks and why green streets aren't happening other places. Thank you. Yes, so we would ideally like to implement green streets everywhere. However, of course, we know this is a pretty large city of 4 million people and a county of 10 million. So we have to prioritize uh, where we implement these projects first and slowly expand from there. So we're focusing on the areas that have the most pressing issues and the greatest opportunities for groundwater recharge. And so, as I mentioned, the San Fernando Valley is one of those areas. I think there was a comment regarding um, providing benefits to areas with higher park needs as well. So not only are our green streets improving uh, areas and transportation corridors in disadvantaged communities, but we're also focusing on park improvements in areas with high park needs, such as the Eastern San Fernando Valley. So we are prioritizing where we infiltrate water and provide those curb cuts and we'll expand that program out further as soon as we can. Thank you, Connor. Annalisa, did you wanna add something there or? 
I can speak quickly. Um, first of all, uh, you know, the vegetation side of things is not necessarily my ex uh, area of expertise. So this idea that, um, you know, not having room uh, for a root system is, I'm assuming, where that's coming from. Um, that's really interesting, and I've, I've made a little mental note to um, to dig into that a little bit deeper. Um, but I do know that you know the the ideal setting is is a variety of um, you know native vegetations with uh, trees, shrubs, and ground cover. So if there's um, opportunities within these parks to have that kind of um, variety of, of native plants, that would be ideal. Um, and then also, while we're talking about the ideal, um, you know, it would be great if we could also create new open space um, in addition to retrofitting the existing open space. Um, but, you know, that comes with uh, it, its own challenges. Um, so just throwing it out there that that's also, um, you know, the, kind of the uh, the best option in terms of um, increasing that natural space for infiltration um, and, uh, you know, shifting slightly away from the um, highly urbanized uh, reality that we are in now. Apologize for that. Thank you for that answer. I'm going to, I see that Jack Humphreyville has a question and he's changed it a little further down. So I'm going to go to the second question. He's asking about the cost of uh, some of these uh, stormwater projects. And the question is that uh, the parks program costs 504 million and provides 3,000 acre feet. And he's computing that to be $168,000 per acre foot. And he thinks it's an absurdly high number. So wanted to ask if you could comment on that uh, in terms of the cost of some of these stormwater retrofit projects. Yes, thank you, and I'm glad he brought this up so that I can help clarify. A um, couple of things to consider is that the water supply estimate that I had provided for these projects is yearly, not over the entire span of the project. So these projects have a useful life of 40 years. So on average, you will want to multiply that benefit by 40 and get the total benefit for these projects. So we want to make sure to look at the entire benefit over the entire lifespan rather than just the yearly benefit. Uh, the other point to consider is that, um, I think I mentioned briefly, uh, this is not just the cost for the stormwater components. Uh, even though we are working very closely to do our cost accounting and stay uh, basically accountable to the ratepayer here in Los Angeles and making sure to use ratepayer funds for stormwater features, when we want to seek outside funding, like grant funding, there may be a parks grant or a, some kind of other grant that provides uh, funding for multi-beneficial projects. Well, these projects provide more than just stormwater benefits and provides park improvements and various environmental improvements as well. So adding trees and native vegetation to these sites, recreational components, enhanced irrigation, efficient irrigation systems. Uh, so they're not just the cost of the stormwater. So we have to make sure when we're looking at the total cost of the projects, we're really also accounting for the other benefits that these projects provide. Thank you, Connor. And our questions list is growing. So I'm going to try to do the best I can. We've got um, a couple of questions here about collaborating and coordinating with BOE and BSS to do stormwater projects. Can you touch on that? Um, and then also, can Measure W facilities be used for indirect potable reuse? Thank you for those questions. Uh, yes, we are coordinating with uh, Bureau of Engineering and Bureau of Street Services as well as other agencies in the region on a lot of these projects. Um, different agencies serve different roles. Bureau of Engineering is helping with the design of our parks program, and they've been tremendously helpful in moving that forward. Bureau of Street Services is doing a lot of Green Street transportation corridor improvements that do provide water supply benefits. So we look forward to partnering with them on projects in the future as well. And I believe the other question was regarding can you remind me that last question? The use of um, the Measure W funds for indirect potable reuse. That's correct. I believe, yes, Measure W funds are eligible for potable reuse stormwater capture as well. So if the project provides um, water supply benefits, whether it's through groundwater recharge or portable reuse or some other means like diverting to water reclamation plant, that would be eligible for Measure W funding as well. 
Okay, the next question is, is from Grant Hogue, and it's to you, Connor, but I, I think others may be able to answer it as well. The question is that centralized stormwater capture projects have multiple regional benefits. They're larger areas, but they're existing parks. And some of our disadvantaged communities, smaller areas, um, really need these um, these types of improvements. And how does this question is about DWP? How does DWP set a value on new park lands within stormwater capture projects? And do you value underserved communities higher? And so, Annalise, I don't know if you or even Greg, uh, this may not be applicable in your area, but if you guys want to respond. Sure, I can tackle it first, then I'll hand over yeah. to Annalise. Um, so, as a municipal water utility, we are our primary goal is water supply. However, yes, we do definitely take into consideration other factors and multi benefits because, in, as I mentioned, in the real world, we can't just look at a project and make it an isolated case and say that we're only going to do water supply. In order to make these projects feasible and move forward, we need to consider other priorities as well. And so, with the parks program, one major benefit is that it is providing park improvements and, in fact, I believe one of those projects, one of the larger ones, Stratton Park North, is creating new park space um, and new recreational opportunities. And so that is a significant benefit to the disadvantaged community that that project is located in. And we are looking at the LA County Park Needs Assessment to prioritize areas that are in high need of uh, parks and park improvements. Thanks, Connor. Um, Annalisa or Greg, did you want to offer anything on this topic? I can add uh, a little bit quickly. Um, uh, first of all, kind of putting on my my Hill Bay, our Water LA advocacy hat. Um, when we're looking at programs like the Safe Clean Water Program, there are goals within these programs um, to prioritize um, or at least have a certain percentage of funding go to um, what is defined in the program as a disadvantaged community. Um, uh, but um, that definition um, has some wiggle room, and um, we feel like there are uh, additional metrics that can be incorporated into that definition to make sure that there are direct benefits in these communities, um, ideally projects being built within the communities and not um, just adjacent to them. Um, and then putting on my, my uh, non-advocacy hat, um, uh, Hilda Bay serves as a watershed coordinator um, for the Central and South Santa Monica Bay, but there are 12 uh, watershed coordinators throughout the Los Angeles County for the Safe Clean Water Program. Um, and uh, having um, folks like that whose job is specifically to connect with community members um, can help to uh, bring out potential projects that are more community-based, more community-driven, which again, you know, that, that's going to get at the core root of what that community needs. Um, so uh, more work on that side of things is always good. And for those of you involved with Measure W, the question Michael Gagan is asking is, if you annually, annually quantify and report the volumes of stormwater captured and infiltrated by the projects? Yes, we do. We do uh, gauge our stormwater capture for all projects, all of our stormwater projects, not just our Measure W projects. So I am pleased to report that this year we have had uh, 90, over 94,000 acre feet uh, of water captured, stormwater captured, starting from the water year in October 2022. So it has been a very wet year and a wonderful year for stormwater capture. And we've got some good comments and some resources that our audience would like our speakers to look at. So I'm going to ask that you scan the Q&A while I continue past to the questions. Um, the next question is from Charming Evelyn, and she's asking, does Orange County Water District have any plans to improve on Measure M to include stormwater capture? And you might want to, Greg, explain what Measure M is. Yeah, in Orange County, we have Measure M. I believe the most recent version is called Measure M2, and that's to um, raise the sales tax to collect funding for transportation projects. There is an environmental component to that. And we're always looking to see if there can be multi-benefit projects that are funded for environmental benefits that also have groundwater recharge benefits. It's sometimes hard to find those, but we're, we're continuing to look for those. Thank you, Greg. Uh, the next question is about urban canopies. And the question is, could the creation and management of urban forests be funded through stormwater fees, given multiple community benefits that urban forests provide? Does anybody know the answer to that question? Okay, we're gonna have to get back to you on that. We don't have the answer today. 
Uh, the next question um, is, okay, this is one of the commentaries. So there's a question about the cost and a study that's showing the levelized cost of about $150 per acre foot for stormwater projects. So I don't know if anybody can comment on this. Um, doubt you have a chance to review the link that's there, but maybe it's something that um, you can talk about generally about the cost of various projects. I would note that each area is different. Um, for example, with what we're doing with forecast informed reservoir operations, it doesn't require building anything. It's using the existing dam differently. So the incremental cost of that new water supply from forecast informed reservoir operations would be very low, well below $100 per acre foot. And that is our lowest cost source of additional water. But again, each of these is very location specific. Thank you, Greg. Um, Connor, your presentation got a lot of questions. So you've got another one from Jeff Moser, and he's asking um, about the water quality benefits. And are you um, accounting for that or, or somehow identifying the, um, the value of the compliance with the MS4 permits, et cetera? And does it, is, does it weigh into the project selection? How much of an emphasis are the water quality drivers? Yeah, that's where regional coordination really comes into play here. So again, DWP is more focused on water supply. However, we do work closely with LA Sanitation, who is as MS4 permittee within the city of Los Angeles, to try to prioritize projects that um, at least all else equal, right, provide greater water quality benefits as well. So we, we are looking at it, we are considering that, um, even though our role is to provide water for Los Angeles in the water supply uh, sense. Um, yes, we do heavily consider that as well. And so um, we are coordinating, for example, on our parks program with LA Sanitation on some of the MS4 compliance and water quality improvement aspects of this and making sure that this is being accounted for in their water quality compliance um, schedules. Thank you. And Greg, Jeff's got a question for you about quantifying the or capturing the stormwater that falls throughout Orange County, not just behind Prado Dam. Can you respond to that? Yes, we do currently capture stormwater that comes down Santiago Creek, which is a significant tributary to the Santa Ana River within Orange County. And we're continuing to, to discuss with our cities and the County of Orange Public Works uh, ways we can capture additional stormwater that occurs within Orange County. Um, those are things that we're continuing to look at. Thank you, Greg. Annalisa, I see you have your hand up. I do, Dee. Um, I had to give it a little bit of thought, but I think I have an answer to the tree canopy question. So I just wanted to circle back to that. Um, with the, the Safe Clean Water Program specifically, um, there is um, sort of a scoring rubric that each project has to be um, evaluated by. Um, and uh, there's a minimum uh, of 60 points. Um, uh, and if you hit that 60 point threshold, you, you move on to be considered for, for funding. Um, and uh, one hurdle there is um, is the you know uh, cost effective um, uh, piece of it uh, when we're looking both at um, uh, water quality um, impacts and then also the water supply and there's often sort of a threshold that you have to hit to to like even start getting points in that area. But um, you're absolutely right that urban forestry, um, you know, has great water quality, water supply impacts, um, especially when we're looking at like what other benefits of stormwater um, uh, are out there for, for ecosystem health. Um, and I would really encourage you to reach out to your watershed coordinator. I'm not sure where you're located um, to talk about the potential of, of a project like this. Thank you, Annalisa. And I apologize, we're gonna to have to close off our questions because we're at the end of our time today. But we have, I've noted that for many of our speakers, there's follow-on questions you might wanna address in future presentations and we'll try to get back to these individuals. Connor, I'm gonna turn it back to you to thank our speakers and close us out. Thank you. Okay, I don't think I can start my video, but I wanted to thank all of our speakers. They did a great job. We covered the job, the issues well, and we had uh, leftover questions. I guess that shows we had lots of interest. So we'll try to get answers back to those. Um, 
Thank you for um, all of you for uh, participating. And uh, I think this is an ongoing issue, but I think we've shown that um, we can do, always do better on, on all levels. Thank you again, bye-bye. And if anyone's interested, the uh, State Water Resource Control Board is still meeting on the water conservation guidelines. <laughs> all right.